And welcome to Nicole Ellison. Nicole is a professor at MSU in the Department of Telecommunication, Information Studies, and Media. Um, she's also a visitor this summer at MSR and working with Dana Boyd and a couple of other folks who are also in the room, I believe. Um, she's here to talk to us about social capital on Facebook. Welcome. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again uh, to the Berkman Center for allowing me to, to share my work. Um, I am a, uh, my training is as a communication um, scholar, as, as some of you here are, um, and the real focus of my work has been for many years how these tools enable us to form and maintain social relationships. Um, I want to point out that uh, all the work that I'm presenting today is, is co-authored and uh, the names of my collaborators are on the screen. Um, and uh, as I said, you know, the, the, uh, the, the question kind of um, animating this particular piece of work is thinking about the social and technical affordances of social network sites, specifically Facebook, and, you know, really trying to understand what are the motivations behind its use. So what, what do people get from uh, using Facebook? So here, for instance, is a, a small, um, you know, a small capture of, of some of my Facebook friends. You know, what, what, what meaning do they have for me in my, uh, in my life? And um, the, the kind of theoretical perspective that we have used to express some of these benefits is social capital. Um, so social capital, kind of the original friends with benefits, uh, this is an established theoretical perspective in the sociological literature, and it essentially describes uh, the resources that can be uh, deployed and activated through your social relationships. Um, so factors that may influence this is kind of the uh, the kinds of people that you have in your um, in your networks. Uh, you know, the size of your network, for instance, um, and uh, you know, there's so if you think about the people that you that you know, um, you probably have different associations and different benefits from them. So for instance, with close friends, uh, we might look to them as a source for social support. Um, I'm actually not going to, to speak about that form of social capital in this presentation, although we have uh, published on that topic elsewhere. Um, the focus of today is bridging social capital. And um, bridging social capital is typically associated with weak ties. Uh, so Granovetter's work on the strength of weak ties speaks to um, the, the kinds of diverse information that we are more likely to re receive from uh, bridging ties, uh, which are more likely to be weak ties. And um, so Granovetter's work specifically looked at the, um, found that people were more, his, his subjects were more likely to find out about valuable job opportunities from people that they didn't see, that uh, see, didn't see as often. Um, and the idea is that we spend a lot of time with people that we're close with. Um, due to homophily pressures, we tend to be attracted to people who are like us. And so people who are um, less like us are more likely to be different in, in productive ways, in useful ways. And uh, Judith uh, Donath and Dana Boyd pointed this out back in 2004 that technologies, um, and I'd insert here such as Facebook, that expand one's social network will primarily res uh, result in an increase in available information and opportunities. Okay, so, um, so thinking about what is a particular kind of instance in which we see this happening, and, and question asking in, in Facebook or social network sites is, is a very nice example of a specific instance where people are trying to mobilize these informational network, uh, informational resources in their network. Um, and this is really the, the focus of, of some of our more recent work. So for instance, here's an example. I ask, you know, what should I uh, do with the kids before leaving Boston? I get a variety of, of responses from my social network, some of them more useful than others. Um, and, you know, a couple of things are happening here, right? So first of all, thinking about norms of reciprocity, and this was um, mentioned in one of the definite, Lynn's definition of, uh, of social capital, which I kind of um, skipped through, but let me just pull it out. So he's talking about this notion that uh, social capital is an investment in social relationships with this expected returns in the marketplace. So if we think about this instance, you know, the fact that these people are answering my question will probably make me more likely to, in the, in the future, um, reciprocate. And um, the other thing to point out is that there's a signaling story that's happening here. So essentially, in, uh, in a site like Facebook, we, uh, we send out status updates, and we really don't have a clear sense of who actually sees them. The, the algorithm um, decides you know, who gets to see what, and unless someone explicitly 
response to a, um, a, a comment or a status update, you really have no sense of whether they've even seen it, whether they're paying attention, whether they care. So there's this um, kind of valuable signaling process here that's, that's happening when people explicitly answer questions. Okay, our, our early work, so we have a piece in the Journal of Computer Mediated Communication in 2007 called The Benefits of Facebook Friends. Um, and in that piece, we used an undergraduate sample and we found a relationship between Facebook use uh, measured by Facebook intensity and uh, social capital. Okay, and really what we've been doing since then is trying to refine our measures um, and get a better understanding of what is the mechanism behind this relationship. So why, why is this happening? Um, and that's, that's the work that I'm presenting today, which isn't, uh, it, it's not published yet. I'm still very receptive to, to feedback about how, how we're thinking about and interpreting our um, analyses. So thinking about why we think Facebook might influence social capital. Um, and I tend to be attracted to the notion of social and technical affordances. So the idea here is that not that Facebook causes X, but rather that it has a set of, it, it makes possible a set of opportunities that human agents can then choose to, um, you know, take up in various ways. So it's, it's kind of moving away from a technologically deterministic perspective. Um, so when we kind of think about it with that lens and thinking about what are the affordances that Facebook has, um, we, we know that it supports a ma the maintenance of a larger network of weak ties, right? So we, many of us have uh, friendship networks in the, in the hundreds, um, and this is probably, um, you know, the, the barriers to kind of maintaining that are lowered. It becomes much easier to kind of keep in touch with this wider network. Um, it also, the information in the profile and, uh, and um, user activity um, is very useful for enabling people to um, kind of connect with latent ties. Um, and so there's a piece that we have in, new, in press and new media and society that talks about social information seeking as a particular strategy that Facebook users um, employ whereby they find out information about someone that they have some kind of offline connection with. They don't necessarily know this person, maybe they just met them very quickly at a party. Uh, maybe in the case of undergraduates, this is someone that is in their dorm, they, they've never really spoken to them. Um, and the idea is that by engaging in what could otherwise be called Facebook stalking, you're finding out about, about this person, you're finding common ground, you're, you have uh, topics of conversation, you might be more willing to engage them in a face-to-face -face interaction. And then finally, just from a kind of transaction, transaction cost perspective, that the, you know, it be, Facebook um, enables users to broadcast these requests for information, advice, and recommendations. And it makes it very easy to receive, to, to respond to those requests. So when I say, um, you know, a request for, um, you know, information or social support, this doesn't necessarily need to be in the form of, you know, I'm having a really bad day. People, please tell me you love me. Um, it could be just I'm having a bad day and this is the, you know, this is one of the mechanisms by which people receive social support. So in, in kind of the, the broader picture, some of the work that we're trying to address with this particular data collection effort is um, determining whether the patterns between social capital and Facebook use that we've identified in undergraduate samples um, hold true for adults. Um, and we're also really uh, thinking about, you know, what are the specific behaviors that are associated with social capital accrual? So if you think about um, research looking at internet use and um, internet effects, it, um, it becomes very clear that it doesn't necessarily make sense to, to just look at whether someone is online or not, because there's such a range of activities that they could be doing, um, which would affect the way in which they're um, accessing this, the social capital in their network. And so the same, I think, is true of Facebook. And if you think about the, diff the wide range of activities, um, it becomes very clear that just kind of measuring um, this kind of global measure of Facebook intensity, as, as we did in our earlier work, doesn't necessarily ma make sense. It doesn't necessarily give us the kind of specificity that we need to kind of start to unpack which behaviors are um, going to be more productive from a social capital perspective. And then uh, finally, we're thinking about this notion of um, the, the, the network on Facebook. So who, who are these friends? 
um, are, are all friends equal, are all Facebook friends equal? Um, and um, so, you know, thinking about the kind of proposition that I put forward that Facebook enables this larger network of weak ties and that this increased this, this more heterogeneous um, kind of network enables access to diverse information. You know, you would think that it's kind of a linear relationship. The more friends, you know, the better, right? Um, but but that act, that's actually not true. Um, and I'll, I'll speak to this um, in, in a minute. But um, this was, again, something that we were interested in kind of parsing out is, is the relationship between number of friends and, and social capital. So the data set that I'll be, um, that were, was used in the analysis that I'll be sharing today um, was collected fairly recently, uh, last fall and, and spring. Um, we've, we are, as I said, attempting to kind of move beyond the student sample. So we are, um, with this case, where we've actually, um, our, survey, our um, sample was MSU staff. So these are individuals who are non-academics. They're not teachers. They're not professors. They're, um, you know, secretaries, administrators, the, uh, those kinds of positions. Um, and you can see that. So the average age, for instance, is 45 years old. So definitely a different demographic than we've looked at before. Um, and we employed a, a multi-method approach. Um, so we have a survey instrument um, that we asked our participants to complete, and this is. This is the, uh, everything I'm presenting today is just based on the survey data. Um, but we also have a whole set of other methods that we're still uh, in the process of, of working through. Um, so for instance, we used Bernie Hogan's Facebook application that basically captures the actual Facebook network um, of friends. And so this will enable us to do some interesting things. We're looking at um, uh, you know, what are the kind of network characteristics of that friends network that are more predictive of social capital, for instance. Um, we have a series of other, um, of other kind of pseudo-experimental techniques that we've used. Um, we did an interview with our uh, participants, um, and we also asked them to request a favor of their network, um, and then we were uh, captured who of their network was uh, responded to that favor, right? So who, so, and, and in, in that sense, we're really trying to think about, okay, well, what is a particular instance in which we can um, capture an actual mobilization of the network? Um, and we didn't want to use a question because a question by its very nature is, you know, some people can answer, some people can't. We thought that would bias it. So this was supposed to be kind of the lowest common denominator of things that people could do. Um, Okay, so the survey measures, and I'll talk about each of these um, individually, but just to kind of give you a sense of where we're going, we're predicting bridging social capital, and then we have a set of um, IVs that we use to, um, to, to be able to understand those relationships. So this is our dependent measure. This is uh, Facebook-specific bridging social capital. Um, this is based on, adapted from the Williams JCMC piece, um, which actually is 2006, sorry about that. Um, and we've kind of gone back to his original um, scale, that, so we have all 10 items. The, the difference here is that we, instead of the online offline, which we felt didn't necessarily make sense in this context, um, we have specifically tried to kind of narrow in on the benefits specific to the site and the connections that are articulated in that space. So you'll see the items are things like interacting with people in my Facebook network makes me want to try new things. Uh, interacting with people in my Facebook network makes me interested in what people unlike me are thinking. So really trying to capture this notion that these are people who are different from you. Okay. Um, so moving along to our IVs, um, in our early work, we asked how many total Facebook friends do you have at uh, MSU, in this case, or elsewhere. And this was combined with minutes on Facebook per day and a set of attitudinal items. Um, and we kind of wrapped that into this Facebook intensity measure. Um, now we're trying to kind of take it apart to be able to see specifically a, a little better what is the kind of effect of these individual um, items. And so. We still ask how many total friends do you have, um, Facebook friends, um, but we've also asked in recent work um, approximately how many of your total friends do you consider actual friends? Um, and this is the, the in-press piece, Ellison et al. in New Media and Society actually has, um, uses this measure to predict social capital. And I will, and um, so essentially what we found is that the total number does, is not a significant predictor, but the number of actual friends is. 
Okay. And just to give you a sense of kind of the descriptives around this, so from our 2008 uh, undergraduate data set, that's the one that was published in the in-press piece, the median total, total number of friends was 300, um, but the number of friends that they reported as actual friends was uh, 75. So about 25% of undergraduates' net, uh, Facebook network would be considered by them actual friends. We did not give them any definition of what we meant by actual friends. We left that for that to interpret. Um, so with our adult data set that I'm presenting today, um, you can see that the median, you know, there's, there's fewer friends, but roughly the same percentage um, are considered actual friends, okay? And um, when, I, when people say, well, what do you think they mean by actual friends? My, my sense of that is that these are people who you're actually interacting with, right? There's a lot of uh, contacts on these sites that um, are just not activated, right? Maybe we've hidden them, maybe they've hidden us, we just don't necessarily in engage with them. Um, and when we look actually at um, data from Facebook itself, um, this is a 2009 uh, memo from the Facebook data team, they actually show that the, the percentage of people that you're having this kind of reciprocal communication with is, is, is a fairly small percentage. Um, so, so here I just want to kind of lay out what we know about the nature of Facebook friends. Um, so as I said, we know that actual friends are more important, at least in terms of predicting social capital, than total friends, that um, we have these large networks, but we only interact with a small number of them, um, a small number of, of friends. Um, there's a very nice piece that I would recommend um, that Maura Burke, um, Bob Kraut, and Cameron Marlowe uh, has uh, published earlier this year, um, where they're actually using um, server data from Facebook itself, um, predicting social capital. Um, and so they can really get at a level of granularity that we can't with, with survey instruments. And what they found was that directed communication with individual friends um, was predictive of social capital gains, but not passive consumption, so kind of lurking, reading, but not posting back, or broadcasting, okay? Um, so the things that they are looking at, I think, are uh, things like, you know, sending messages, liking something, um, you know, posting on someone's wall, di uh, directed is, is the key here. Um, but then I think kind of the, um, you know, kind of coloring all of this is this notion that, the, that we don't necessarily know who is, um, who is seeing our, our content um, when, when we're posting it, and that this is the newsfeed algorithm. Um, it's very obscured unless someone is specifically commenting back. So we developed a measure that we call cultivation of social resources, um, and this captures kind of instances in which you are um, you know, so a sample item is uh, when I see a friend asking for advice on Facebook, I try to respond. Okay, so the idea is that you specifically, you are reporting specifically um, responding to requests that you see among your Facebook network. Okay, and um, this was an extremely powerful um, predictor. This is a kind of a behavior that we should all do if we're trying to kind of harness the social capital benefits of, of social network site use. Um, and essentially when we're thinking about why this might be, um, there's a few things going on. So one is when you specifically respond, you're kind of creating this expectation about reciprocal behavior. <coughs> so going back to Lynn's you know, co concept of social capital as expected returns in the marketplace. Um, there's also a social grooming function that we, that we think is happening. So um, thinking about um, you know, social grooming, this idea that you know, these are activities that affirm relationships, they, um, they uh, display bonds and alliances, um, and they also, uh, in this case, signal attention. So the idea here is that you are kind of telling people you're important to me, I, I see you. Um, the, the third, is, which is kind of a technical consideration, is, is this idea that um, engaging in these behaviors can kind of train the news feed. So for instance, if I'm responding to a lot of what Fred is posting, um, and he then kind of responds back with a thank you or whatnot, I can expect that I'm showing up probably it more, pre um, more predominantly in his news feed because um, Facebook interprets me as a, a, a relevant um, source of information for him. Okay, and then uh, last but not least, these kind of behaviors, I think, can, can kind of activate these dormant ties within the network. So these are people who kind of are just out there, um, and by, you know, responding to them, you can kind of bring them back into the fold of your uh, actual friends. 
So this is the actual scale. Um, so I think you can all probably read that. Um, but again, the notion here is that these are behaviors that um, probe the respondent's you know, willingness to try to respond when they see a request from someone in their Facebook feed. Okay? Um, they're activating ties, you know, that these are, um, you know, that, that, that essentially, uh, you know, through this norm of reciprocity. I, I want to point out that there is one that is slightly different, which is when a uh, Facebook friend has a birthday, I try to post something on their wall. That's slightly different in that it's not kind of responding to a request in the same way. But again, there's a very kind of strong social grooming story, I think, there, that you're kind of paying attention to, to someone um, that it, where you want to signal that. Okay, we also included an item that uh, measures, or I'm sorry, a scale that measures information seeking behavior. And this is um, attempting to kind of measure activities, um, you know, the extent to which people are employing Facebook in a specific way as a channel for seeking information. So they're engaging in this instrumental engagement with the network for information uh, related goals, such as, um, you know, asking questions about health uh, issues getting questions to specific answers, getting product recommendations, business referrals. Um, so these are people who are actually um, it, specifically looking to Facebook to kind of information um, for solving information, um, information needs. So when we, um, when we do, uh, so, so essentially what we do is we have a series of models here. These are nested OLS. Um, regressions. Um, the first, so again, we're predicting bridge, bridging social capital, and um, so uh, this is just with the um, just with the kind of controls, if you if you will. Um, so information seeking and cultivation of social resources aren't in there yet. I'll show those in a moment. Um, but what I want to point out is that um, actual friends on Facebook is significant, but not the total friends. Okay, um, and also Facebook minutes per day. Um, is as well as gender. Um, when we introduce the information seeking behavior, so these are, you know, I use Facebook to get questions from my network. Um, you can see that uh, that becomes significant and actual friends is still significant, but uh, kind of total time on Facebook is not. And also the R square increases here to, to 31 um, from 14 something, 14. And uh, in the th so this is the third model where we've introduced the cultivation of social resources. So again, that's that kind of reciprocity uh, measure that I talked about. And here you can see that the R square goes up um, now to, to uh, 0.45, and that <coughs> that is um, a fairly powerful predictor of um, of these self-reported um, assessments of, of uh, bridging social capital. Um, and I, I'm not going to show it, but we did test for an interaction effect between uh, cultivation of social resources and actual friends, um, which was significant. And so this is work that we're still trying to figure out, but I'll, I'll present it anyway. Um, so essentially, we did a um, simple slopes calculation um, to try to figure out what is this kind of um, interaction between actual friends and cultivation of social resources. Um, and you can see that at all, so this is uh, cultivation, these are people who report high levels of these cultivation of social resources um, behaviors. And you can see that all of these are higher than the people who are low. Um, what's interesting is that for, um, so the blue line is uh, low actual friends. And you can see that for these individuals, there's actually, you know, an interesting effect where they are actually reporting higher levels of bridging social capital than people with high numbers of friends who are not engaging in these behaviors. So essentially, this is a very kind of powerful way of, you know, even if you have a few actual friends, if you're engaging with them in these way, um, in these um, CSR um, behaviors, you're actually kind of activating them and going to um, you know, going to report higher social capital um, from it. So essentially, I'm, I'm going to um, kind of uh, close up here. I just wanted to kind of frame this as, you know, what, so what we've been trying to do over the last, I would say, five years now is really kind of focusing on specific behaviors, not, and moving away from kind of global measures of use to kind of better understand what are the mechanisms behind social capital and social network site use. Um, the information-seeking variable is, is one that we are... Um, 
have identified, and then I think more interesting, at least for me, is this is this cultivation of social resources, um, and you know the idea that these are particular activities that thinking about the social and technical affordances of the newsfeed, right, and of uh, Facebook use, um, that these are activities that actually have a very clear story in terms of communication. So as a social grooming, um, in terms of social capital in terms of these norms of reciprocity and then just also kind of from a technical perspective, right, the idea that you are kind of training the, the news feed. So, um, so this is what we will be spending time thinking about and that I would welcome kind of uh, thoughts and feedback on. Just in terms of future work, um, I think I mentioned that we had the network data and so now we're starting to kind of see the relationship between the specific you know, network, right? So who's friends with who among your Facebook friends? Um, those kinds of social network uh, variables and our social capital measures. We're also moving through our data set, so looking, for instance, at those requests to see who responds, who doesn't. Um, and then also uh, spending a bit more time looking at privacy issues, which was not an original um, kind of focus of the work, but we've really come to understand that um, most of these social capital benefits are predicated on the notion that you are disclosing something, right? If you are not going to tell your network that you're sick or that you're looking for a new job, it's much more unlikely that you'll be able to kind of extract that, in, that information and social support from your network. And so the extent to which these disclosures then are going to kind of unanticipated audiences or are kind of going to different parts of your life that you want to keep separate, um, really uh, make it clear that controlling who the audience is, is is kind of the key to be able to enable people to disclose in meaningful ways while still avoiding privacy concerns, context collapse, a lot of these kind of the downfalls of, of un unintended audiences. Um, so uh, that's it. All, all our papers, including the in-press one, is on our my website. And I wanted to point out also this is work supported by the National Science Foundation, much to the chagrin of conservative senators everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I'd love uh, feedback or questions or... Uh -huh. Hi. Uh, in your previous slide, you mentioned that broadcasting does not build as much social capital as like, direct interaction, like interpersonal communications. But I mean, this probably touches on privacy and like the way that Twitter works. So from what my own personal experience is that my posting, I received, like I did not realize how many people read that. And it's actually like significantly higher than I realized. And how do you think this effect of other people knowing more about you than you realize changes the dynamics of people's relationship with, with each other, especially in the university like environment? Sure, so let me just point out that that finding is actually from the Burke et al paper. So it's B-U-R-K is, is the last name, uh, Mora. And I, I, I would, so I would encourage you to go to that piece, but let me uh, um, address your other question about kind of this notion that we have information, I think, about, um, you know, more information about others, kind of. Um, so I think, I think the, the real um, concern is when we are not necessarily aware of the audience. So in the kind of anecdote that you gave, you know, you, you said that you were getting feedback of some sort that kind of made you realize, oh, these people are in our, in my audience. Feedback. Offline feedback. Like, how did you know that? Okay, so, um, so that's actually, I think, um, you know, a system where that, that's, that, that has worked in some way, right? So now, now you know, and of course, um, a better design would be that you have better awareness of that from the beginning. Um, but I think the, you know, the, the more concerning um, action would be when you have audiences that you're, that you're not aware of or that you are, um, you know, where there is a real need to not, um, you know, not disclose information to them. So, for instance, if I find that I have, um, you know, um, a disease, right, this may be something that's important for me to share with my close friends. I don't necessarily want all my work colleagues. I don't want the HR person at my organization knowing this. And so with um, Facebook specifically, especially as we see it adopted by so many more adults, um, there is much more of an opportunity for context collapse where people are um, have kind of segments of their identity or their network that they are able to compartmentalize in offline settings and here they are 
all, you know, all kind of mushed up into one big uh, audience. And so I think that's the, the concern. Alice uh, Marwick, who's here, has written on this as well. Uh-huh. Um, I sometimes will uh, have like a separate Facebook list and actually will make status updates viewable only by certain groups of people. Is that a common thing, or is that the only the type of thing that a computer geek like myself would actually bother with and understand? I, I would actually defer to Fred, who's done more work specifically looking at privacy settings. My sense is that it's not all that common. Um, but in our, we have a, a chapter coming out that looks at privacy issues, and basically we're arguing that using lists like that is actually a very productive strategy because it enables you to, to still disclose, but to avoid the kind of unwanted audiences. So I think if so, I think that's a, that's actually a, a productive strategy. It does not seem to make it like, pleasant to do it in the UI, but you can do it. Sure, sure, yeah. And I, I think the my, my my sense is that people are not um, not doing that to the extent that you might expect. Just just to uh -huh. add on to that, there's been some recent news stories that younger kids now are they're figuring out an app. I think there's an app out there where they can say it can't go. This information can't go to such and such people, meaning their parents. So I think it's starting to become more. <laughs> so. Sure, sure. And there's so there's probably specific audiences that we can all think of that might be motivating, right, to, to take the trouble yes. to do that. So in the case of a child, perhaps a parent. <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> could you remind me what your dependent variables were and if they were all self-reports? Yes, actually, yeah. So, so it's bridging social capital. Um, this is a, a perceptual, you know, assessment of the extent to which you are um, accessing different parts of your, you know, ex being exposed to new information. Um, this, this is something that we're thinking about um, so and, and working on. Um, so, for instance, in another piece, we use a social provision scale that's a, kind of validated out there in the social support literature as a way of moving away from the bonding social capital and trying to look a bit more specifically. But so yes, the, they're like, all you, self report You have the desire to travel all those for your measures? Correct. That, that was the okay. DB, yeah. yeah. So the, the favor asking is kind of our attempt to get a better sense of, so that we're not just asking about perceptions, but we can actually see who did this favor for these people when they requested it. Um, the, the limitation there is that we don't necessarily, we can't assume that everyone in the network saw that favor, right, because of the algorithm. So that's that's a challenge that we're going to have to think about. Mm -hmm. What's your, um, your sort of hypothesis for the gender difference that you found? Mm. Um, well, I think, uh, let's see. So in, um, right, so where women, well, although it falls out in the cultivation of social resources, no. um, in, the, in the final model when that's, uh, so it may be that women are engaging, you know, in those behaviors more, responding to requests. What other social networks they're on? Because I know a, a lot of people will use, let's say, LinkedIn for one motivation, Twitter for another. If it's a health-related issue, let's say if they have a wellness or caring page for another issue. So did you ask something that that got to how many other social networks there may be um, on or using? We did. I don't think it's um, – we – I mean, we would probably look at that independently. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I think it's an interesting question because when you do kind of divide up, um, you know, when you have different sites for these kind of to address different kind of components of your life in a sense, um, you know, what, uh, what I think that enables is kind of deeper self-disclosures and kind of more, uh, you know, subject-specific interactions. Um, the, the, the kind of downside is that when you're thinking about the diversity of a network, if you've got it kind of parceled out like that, you're not necessarily going to have the kind of cross-fertilization that might happen. So, for instance, when I post a message, uh, a status update, and two friends who don't know one another are, you know, engaging in a dialogue, I, I mean, I think for me that's a very kind of exciting um, instance because these are people who are from different networks. I mean, this is kind of the, the you know, Bert's kind of structural whole, right? Um, but they are interacting in a in a in a uh, forum that I think is going to you know I would speculate would be 
have a different kind of tenor than if these were two people who had different <coughs> political beliefs and were in an anonymous chat room, for instance. Like I would expect that this, you know, that the because they are visible to their networks, because they have me as a friend in common, because of the kind of norms of Facebook, that that um, interaction would be kind of qualitatively different between two people who didn't necessarily agree on something. Um, so I guess to kind of get back to your point is that I think that um, when you have these kind of uh, segments, which I agree people people do, and LinkedIn is probably the best known example of a professional network, um, that you lose the opportunity for those kinds of cross, uh, you know, fertilization from different parts of your network. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I, I have a question about the interaction effects, mm -hmm. and it's early. It's early oh, so. okay. I mean, that's something, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so just just kind of thinking about the relationship between high, medium, and low, mm -hmm. and the outcome variable, um, I'm wondering if you considered rescaling that as a proportion, because I assume you're just using means. Yeah. And so, like, the, so somebody could have very few actual friends, but lots of not actual friends, and, and somebody could have you know, very few actual friends, and that'd be a big proportion of their their network, and it seems like there might be some relationship to the type of social capital you could accumulate, and so I'm wondering... Hmm. Okay, so looking at kind of percentages? Yeah, exactly. As opposed to just yeah. raw numbers? As opposed to raw means, yeah. It, it seems like yeah. the distributions would be different. Yeah, I mean, we can certainly look at that. I, yeah. I guess my kind of understanding of who these non-actual friends are yeah. is that they're essentially invisible. I mean, they're, they're there, they're, you know, if you go to your friends list, you see them, um, you perhaps right. never, you, you know, you're not really engaging with them. And so, you know, one, if you, if you look at those, um, you know, the numbers of how many actual friends, I mean, they're, they're like a hundred. Yeah. So it's not, you know, this isn't just close friends. These are people who I think you have some kind of engagement with on the site. Um, and, uh, so I, so I guess I'm, I would be less inclined to think that it would necessarily matter because I, um, my sense is, is that those people are just kind of invisible, in, in perhaps until you post something that you don't want them to, to see. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, is your, is your, so what, what is the kind of rationale for thinking that that percentage would, would, would matter? Well, I, I guess yeah. I'm trying to tease out the relationship between how not actual friends don't figure into the estimation of bridging social capital. Yeah. Um, because through like the news feed and things like that, we're, we're definitely going to be seeing people that we don't consider to be our actual friends, which I, I see could be part of the, or contribute to an understanding of bridging social capital. And so the, the ratio that I'm talking about is kind of thinking about, okay, so somebody could have like five actual friends, actual friends, but hundreds of non-actual friends, and I think they would be a sort of a different, different type of mm. person in the data set than somebody who has five actual friends and ten total friends, and especially <laughs> considering <clears throat> the type of population that you're studying, mm -hmm. and so <clears throat> treating as a ratio might produce a, a different effect. Yeah, yeah, no, I can see that, and I think really maybe this is where our network data may be interesting to mm -hmm. to um, to try to kind of suss out who are those non actual friends. I, I guess my theory of yeah. the ratio is yeah. the interaction effect would go away. Mm. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess my, so I think different assumptions. My assumption would be that people, if you're seeing them in your news feed, mm -hmm. you would consider them in that actual friends. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, I mean, that's, that I'm yeah. thinking of all these people who are just yeah. like basically invisible. Okay. They've, yeah. We have different assumptions. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. So, um, yeah. Uh, uh huh. It, uh, me. Yeah. Um, following on that, I, I was thinking about this. It seems like there might be an interesting middle category there of people who um, are acquaintances but not close friends. And so, you know, if you have a high ratio of people who you consider to be, I mean, if you have a low ratio of people you consider to be close friends versus your <coughs> net overall Facebook friends, um, I'm curious if you would see a different sort of pattern of behaviors. And that was the question I was going to ask, is if you saw with different numbers of friends people had, different patterns of what uses they made. Like, did they use private messaging versus broadcasting? 
um, for example. Because it seems to me like broadcasting often isn't done in an anonymous way. It's done with an assumed audience. Sure. Um, and so I wonder whether people who broadcast a lot are, tend to be people who have a high ratio of close friends to their overall. Um, and I also wanted to ask um, how you're thinking of using the network structure data uh -huh. in the bigger project. Sure, yeah. sure. So the network data, um, one, uh, so looking at kind of the network characteristics, and I'm not a social network analysis person, so this is Bernie Hogan at OII is actually the one who's um, d doing a lot of this work. But the idea is to kind of think about, um, you know, what is the you know, what, what, thinking what we know about social network theory and what we would expect, right, about, for instance, structural holes and, you know, clusters and things like that. How does that kind of map on to our um, findings around social capital? But I think perhaps even more interestingly um, would be thinking about this. Uh, and so we have the self-report survey data and the network data from the same participants. So even though it's a smaller subset, we can um, look at the way in which those um, kind of social behaviors moderate the, the network characteristics. Um, and, uh, and I think there will be some interesting, um, I think there'll be some interesting effects that we'll, we'll be able to see, that we're, we're starting to look at. And um, that's really kind of in a similar fashion showing that engaging in these cultivation of social resources is actually a way of kind of compensating for a network that on the face of it would be less productive from a social capital perspective. And again, I think it has to do with this idea that you're kind of activating these, uh, these ties. Remind me what your other question was. Um, whether or not um, you see distinctions in the affinity for different types of behaviors on Facebook, different types of communication practices by those who fit in the high versus low friends categories. So some using more private method messaging versus others broadcasting and things like that. Sure. So we didn't. Um, so we didn't ask specifically about that kind of granularity of of behavior. Um, what I can tell you is that in the in-press piece, we have, um, we've identified three kind of suites of communication behaviors. Um, so one of them is uh, interacting with close friends on Facebook, and the mean for that is very, very high. So every, if you have a friend, a close friend on Facebook, you friended them, you've, you know, interacted with them on Facebook, etc. Um, on the other extreme, we have a uh, kind of a scale that measures the extent to which you are kind of looking for strangers to friend on Facebook. And this, as you would imagine, it's not a normative behavior, it's very low. Um, we have a third kind of set of behaviors that we call social information seeking. And this, um, this describes the extent to which people are using the site to find out kind of more information about someone that they have some kind of offline connection with. It's not a total stranger, um, but they haven't necessarily kind of um, activated that tie yet. And so we hypothesize that people are using the kind of identity information that they uh, discover in Facebook to do things like find out what do we have in common? What's our common ground? What can we talk about? Um, you know, if I'm sitting next to you in a large class, so for instance, one of those items was um, I use Facebook to find out information about someone in a, in a large class, something like that. Um, and so the idea is that, you know, we would speculate that you find out you have something in common and it kind of lowers the barriers to a face-to-face -face interaction. It makes it easier to talk about something that you already know you have in common. Um, you know, I think the interesting question is how exactly do you introduce that information without it seeming creepy, yeah. right? So that's kind of a whole other set of, of questions. So Facebook yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, but, um, but anyway, to kind of tie it back to the social capital story, of those three kinds, like suites of communication behaviors, uh, connection strategies we call them, um, only that social information seeking was predictive of, of um, bridging social, of, of actually both forms of uh, social capital. And I think that, you know, so the idea is that if you've already have, if you have these close friends, you're already interacting with them in other ways. Facebook doesn't really make a, a you know, isn't really going to have a meaningful impact on how you kind of exchange social support um, with a close friend. And then on the other extreme, the kind of looking for complete strangers is not very normative. I mean, I think that's a clear kind of um, 
you know, descent into creepiness, right? But, uh, but this kind of this middle ground, um, that's where I think there's some very kind of interesting um, dynamics around using online information to facilitate a meaningful connection in some way. And whether that is online interaction or offline interaction, it doesn't really matter t to me. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, oh, I'm sorry, you had your hand up before. Uh-huh. Yes, you. Um, yeah. I was just curious, I know, if, like, the people who have a lot of social capital through Facebook were also the same type of people who had social capital in the offline world, or if suddenly there's sort of a new group of people who are sort of shy norm out, uh, normally but are suddenly empowered by the, all these online tools. Sure, sure. So actually with, uh, so in the past we've used a measure of social capital that kind of um, specifically references MSU for our MSU undergraduate samples. Um, in this data collection effort, we've done something different, which is we actually ask um, the same set of measures twice. One is asking about interactions with their Facebook network, and that's what I prevented, uh, presented here. Um, we have another set of um, scales that is the same, you know, this, the same es essential question, but we're, we've asked them to think about everyone in their social network, kind of online and offline, and then answer the questions thinking about just, um, you know, your, your broader social network, not constrained to Facebook in any way. Um, and we find the same patterns, but the effect is, like, the, the, R, the, the effect is less. Like, essentially, the R squared are lower. Um, it's not, you know, Facebook use isn't making as much of a difference, but it's, it's still significant. But that's a great, I mean, that's the kind of thing that we're, we're definitely trying to suss out. Um, uh-huh. Um, I'm just wondering, you mentioned audience a couple of times. Sure. And that really brings it back to communication for me, mm -hmm. um, too. And Mary and Dana, I believe, had a, a, an article in... Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, in New Media and Society about imagined audience. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, in the, the data that you had in the interview data, if anybody had talked about who they envision as their audience or maybe their network, did, did they talk about that at all? Um, it came up a couple of times, um, and so, for instance, one of the things that we were thinking of, interested in looking at is um, the extent to which people were using it for kind of professional purposes, which is, of course, one of those instances where it's, um, you know, there's some kind of high stakes there, right, in terms of what you're disclosing to people you, uh, you work with. So I, I can't speak to the interview. It was still being transcribed. Okay. Yeah, so I can't say anything meaningful. Um, Although, if anyone else wants to, no, okay. I, I think, I think that it, there's a couple of things that it might depend on. I'd be, I'd be very curious if in you know mm -hmm. six months or whatever yeah. you find some of this stuff. Yeah. I think that, um, from what, what we got, what we got a general sense, and we don't say this in the paper because we didn't have like firm, clear data for it was that on Twitter or Facebook, people tend to think of the people who pop up in their news feed or in their Twitter feed as the people that they're talking to, which is exactly what Nicole is talking mm -hmm. about when she talks about actual mm -hmm. friends, like the people that you see. So you think of those people as people you're talking to, and that's who you imagine mm -hmm. speaking to when you're writing a post for that particular audience. And I think that that speaks to this sort of like, if you're lurking, you're, people aren't People don't know you're there. I mean, obviously, that's right. what it means to be a lurker. But it also, you don't get to become part of that audience. And then I think there's other groups of people who have specifically segmented their audience in particular ways. And they, whether or not they've been successful with that or not, I think then they imagine that they're speaking to like, okay, well, this is my Twitter account that I only use for professional purposes, right? Or this is my Facebook account that I only use to communicate with my family. Whether or not those are actually the people that they're speaking to or not, I think, is very different. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so to think, carry that, so I would imagine that the disclosures you make when you've constrained that audience um, may be uh, more productive for kind of bonding social capital, but that segmentation is limiting the, you know, the extent to which you have that kind of more heterogeneous network. Um, yeah. Uh -huh. After they try to make the request? When, when were the interviews done? Uh, I believe they were done after they tried to make the request, but we gave the friend network two days. So they didn't necessarily, and the person wouldn't have necessarily known who had done the favor or not. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. And, and the other question I have that comes off of that is how reflective 
uh, were the people that uh, were in the sample, the 666 people that were in the sample, um, how reflective were they about maybe how them just participating in this study changed their Facebook habits? I can't speak to that, um, but uh, but I think that the act of asking them to ask their network, if uh, in terms of any of our measures or any, I mean, I, I would point to that as probably being the the most kind of perhaps disconcerting or enlightening, depending on you know how you want to frame it. Um, and so, and we actually had uh, a couple of people who who refused, um, who said, I don't want to. I don't want to put this out there in my in my stat in my but status I update. Because they know that somebody, in this case you or your fellow yeah. researchers, are watching them, maybe are getting more friends or are posting just a little bit more than let's say their norm, mm -hmm. because suddenly they know that they're part of this Facebook study. Um, so we weren't really mm -hmm. gathering data uh -huh. on, at that level uh, about behavior. Mm -hmm. So I don't. Think they would have any sense that we were kind of fo following them in any way. I, I saw, I'm sorry, was there a question back here before? Uh -huh. So you mentioned something about uh, all your friends on Facebook being equal. So you know, someone who's been a lifelong friend and someone who's just in a class with you, can it become equal in the scope of Facebook? Because when you broadcast, you broadcast to everybody. And that kind of, with the person that you just met in a class, you kind of skip the natural process of becoming someone's friend. So I want to know what you thought about, you know, if Facebook has at all kind of redefined the notion of what a friend is. Um, so, okay, so just to clarify, I, I don't think all friends are equal, okay, right? Well, you, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but in terms of like audience, you know, when you broadcast, you do kind of broadcast to everybody in the same way, whether you're thinking of them or not. Sure, sure. So, um, so I think your question about uh, Facebook kind of redefining friendship is, is very interesting, and, and I'm sure we've all kind of seen, um, you know, popular press stories that kind of decry the, you know, the, the death of friendship because, you know, no one can have 500 friends and that's, it's a kind of meaningless concept and, um, and it's a, you know, violation of, of friendship. And I, and I actually think that our findings actually um, point out the fact that people are cognizant of the fact that 75% of their network is not an actual friend. So I think that um, I think that we're kind of doing a disservice to users if we assume that they are um, kind of have this uniform understanding of friendship. I think that that people are much more savvy than that, and that they have a very clear you know they that they have a very clear sense of um, you know friend fr friendship is a term that Facebook used to describe a connection on the site. So I, I, my, my sense is, is that I, I think we are probably as humans aware of that um, and that I, I don't necessarily think that we need to be worried, and not that you, you were doing this, but there's been a, a fair amount of, of kind of coverage of this, this idea um, that somehow you know, Facebook is, is killing the notion of friendship. Um, I think it's it's definitely redefining the ways that we're connecting with people that we're form you know that we're maintaining these weak ties that we're um, kind of uh, finding common ground with people. So I think I think there's a lot of changes that are happening, but I um, but I don't think we need to be worried about kind of um, redefining friendship in that way. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a small point. But it's, I think it's still worth mentioning. Are you at all worried about like a recency bias, um, in that like people that you recently added or recently met are more likely to appear in your newsfeed than old, long-standing friends, um, particularly if people are like accumulating friends relatively quickly. Maybe with the size of the networks we're looking at, it doesn't really matter. But for some people, I think it could be an issue. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think um, again, I think that just you know thinking about the one item. I don't know. I mean, we're again. We're, I don't think we're getting at that level of specificity. I, I think people probably, you know, first they're like, "What do you mean by actual friends?" And then they just try to kind of take, you know, their best kind of understanding of what that means. And yeah. Well, I think just to go back to your point, like I went on my phone and looked at my newsfeed, and like there, a lot of those people I wouldn't consider actual friends, whereas many people I consider actual friends don't often appear on my newsfeed. 
particularly if I live in the same city with them, as them and interact with them sort of outside of Facebook. Sure, sure. Um, and of course, there's different platforms. Yeah. So for instance, when I'm on my laptop, I'm seeing a very different news feed than when I'm on my um, on my phone. So um, yeah, I mean, I think that the interesting and the very, very challenging thing for a researcher is kind of how to measure and kind of conceive of all these <laughs> offline interactions that, you know, are, uh, are, are kind of a, a black box as far as we're concerned. I mean, we, we're very, very careful in our measures to, so for instance, with the ones about, um, you know, try to respond, like we, that was a, you know, that response may be, I see you face to face and I answer that question. Or I, you know, I call you up because I see that you just announced that you were sick. Yeah. So we, we're very, very careful about trying to not limit ourselves to only online interactions. Because I think what, um, you know, these two kind of online and offline you know, we've been kind of thinking of them as separate worlds, and they're so fluid, and, you know, and there's, there's just kind of a greater communication ecology in which information we get in one channel is affecting the way we interact in others. So I think that's a great question. That's, that's actually, so this whole New Media and Society piece that I've been talking about, you know, w what we were trying to do with those scales is kind of um, unpack a finding that we had in 2007, which was the extent to which people are, you know, is it online to offline or offline to online? And we realize that's probably not the most um, useful way to think about it. Um, and so again, but, but, you know, I can't, for me to ask you, um, you know, did you, uh, you know, is this an online friend or an offline friend, right? Or where did you, you know, I mean, maybe, um, Maybe our first interaction was was face to face, but it was only because I saw information about you online. How do you capture that in a survey question? So, I mean, these are the kinds of things that keep me up at night. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Just um, thinking back to your differentiating actual friends and leaving that amorphous. Is there any more maybe specific typology that emerged from your interviews? Because again, reflecting on personal experience my closest or my actual friends, I don't interact with them at all on Facebook. Uh, whereas the people I interact with tons on Facebook, they're sort of Facebook friends uh, that we you know, have these great discussions, or, but it's just limited to that and we don't really interact outside of that. So I'm wondering if you saw anything Sure, sure. Um, well, so again, and I'm sorry to keep saying this, but we haven't looked at that data yet, but so for instance, what we did do is we asked our participants to show us an example from their Facebook feed of an instance where they had asked a question, um, and then we had each of them rate the closeness of each of the people who responded. Um, so for instance, that would get us at some of that. Um, you know, the network data, I think also, would, would give us kind of a vocabulary for, for talking about that. So yeah, I think that's, you know, there's, there's just a, a, a lot of interesting work that can be done to really kind of untangle these different levels of closeness and utility and interaction and every, er, everything that's that's going on. Uh-huh, Fred. Oh, so, and sorry, oh, I didn't see you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, I think this uh, information search variable is really cool mm -hmm. and, um, and and very important. So mm -hmm. This I'm, one? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, maybe asking to speculate a little bit, sure. do you think that the um, this variable is different in this population um, as compared to like, undergraduates? And do you think that it's changing over time? So is Facebook getting more important as an information search um, location? I um, yes to the later latter question. Um, and you know I I, um, I I think in terms of think and, and you know and that's I think really there's a lot of attention right now being paid to kind of social search and uh, and the idea that people are going to kind of harness their network. Um, because they will give, because you know, that's the place where they think they will get more relevant information. Um, you know, so for instance, in our interview uh, data from another sample, we had a, a woman who was talking about how when her child was sick, she went to Facebook and asked what medicine she should give her child and went, instead of going to Google, uh, and when we asked her about this, um, she said, well, these are people who've actually used the medicine and they can, you know, tell me more about it. It's not just like going off to Google and finding some random person. And I mean, as a parent, I was somewhat horrified by this, but I mean, I think that that was, you know, this, this notion that, that, um, that, that those answers are seen as more kind of directed at me 
Um, however, I think you lose this kind of the neutral, right, kind of information um, that might be provided by a kind of more open search um, engine. But it, to answer your question about the difference in, in samples, um, so let's see. Um, so the, the um, I think that probably the items would look different. About music might be something that we wouldn't see with the adults, but maybe would with a with an undergraduate sample. Um, and I guess in terms of the extent to which they're kind of specifically doing that, I guess I couldn't say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious, sort of, to take a step back from. I think you did a really nice job doing a whole lot of the kind of hard details of the how to operationalize all this stuff. But if you could sort of simplify it a little bit and. What would, what would be the, if you woke up tomorrow and you were a social science, you know, deity and you could, you could have the universe work however you wanted, uh, what would be the experiment that this would look I mean, what would you, what, what's the thing that, mm. what's the kind of big underlying thing that you're trying to see if Facebook does or is it, is it something that Facebook does? Is it... I mean, what's the, it's sure. an unfair question. So, it's yeah, and I guess, I know, yeah. yeah, and I, I think that's a great question. So, um, so I guess I, and I probably should have said this kind of at the beginning, that I don't necessarily consider, I mean, so Facebook is, for me, a particular technology that captures, you know, that has a lot of these interesting affordances. So for someone who has kind of studied social impacts of new media for, for many years, this is... Um, you know, kind of a, a, a beautiful, you know, context in which to explore a lot of those questions um, be, because of you know, a whole bunch of stuff I've talked about. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess in the grand scheme of things, um, I don't mean, I, I don't mean to, I mean, 10 years from now, I don't think I'll be studying Facebook. I mean, I think this is a particular instance, instance in which, larger, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but I do think that it is reshaping the the extent to which we can, you know, the the way in which we form and maintain social relationships, and and um, you know, and all the benefits of communication that that we know about, right? So, I mean, this is all the this is all happening because we're communicating on the site all of these kind of social capital benefits. So that's really kind of the true motivation: is how is this affecting, you know, the the communication? Can, can are there communication theories that we can apply? Can we extend, you know, mm -hmm. theory through some of this work. Um, I think in terms of if I woke up and I could have kind anything, I, yeah, I mean, I think, I think one, um, you know, I think one missing piece, and, and this is kind of brought up in a lot of the questions, is that, you know, we're limited in a survey to how many questions we can yeah, ask. Yeah. And, and also there's, you know, self-report and recall challenges. And um, so, for instance, being able to ask at a more granular, granular level about the specific relationships or the specific behaviors. You know, are you liking something? I mean, that's just... And to know that they were telling you... Yeah, exactly. So I, think, so I think the kind of behavioral data that mm -hmm. Facebook itself has access to and have, have been, you know, working with and publishing and, and you know, I'm happy that's to see that work. Yeah. Um, so I think that, the, you know, they're in a position of being able to kind of answer some of those questions in a, in a, because it's behavioral and because it's nuanced in a way that we can't get at. Yeah. Uh huh. I was wondering if you uh, worked at all with the same students repetitively, so that you could see how their sort of structure of their network changes over time, like creating panel data or something like that through repeated surveys of their perception of their social capital. Um, because I kept, I, I, I kept wondering how you differentiate, say, between uh, these patterns being a reflection of already their social habits. That's a great versus, question, kind of the chicken and the egg. Yeah, is it exactly. just that people who have more kind of social capital to begin with are going to then use the site more? Um, so we do have a piece, it's uh, Steinfeld Ellison et al, 2008, and it's on that uh, pubs page um, right there. Uh, and it's in the Journal of Applied Developmental Psychology. And uh, we have three, uh, three years of panel data and what we do in that piece is we look at social capital at time one, Facebook um, use at time one, social capital at time two, Facebook use at time two, and we uh, look at the strength of the relationship between Facebook use at time one and social capital at time two and 
social capital at time one and Facebook at time two. And we show that there's indeed a stronger relationship between Facebook use at time one and social capital at time two than the other way around. So again, we, you know, we can't necessarily make causal relationships, and I apologize if I've kind of insinuated that in any way, but, um, but I think that piece with the panel data does address at least some of those concerns about directionality, which I, which I think is, is an excellent point. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Given that you had, oh wait, first I thought um, Facebook stopping the descent into creepiness should be a journal title. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I won't call out that. Uh, I, um, I just provided the title of volunteering. Uh, my question, uh, given that you had the social networks, um, why <coughs> self-reporting for the total number of Facebook friends? Um, sure, and actually in the, so we, uh, so because this was all self-report, we kind of wanted to keep that consistent. We do have the number of nodes, um, and that was used, that's what we're using in the social network analysis. And I think they're pretty highly correlated, although not exactly. Yeah, but great, great question. Okay, thank you very much. This is really interesting.